morning, everybody, or I should also say good afternoon or good evening, uh, wherever you may be, particularly if you're in uh, Azerbaijan or other areas in the Caucasus region. Uh, I'm Dick Morningstar. I'm the founding chairman of the Global Energy Center uh, at the Atlantic Council. I also had the pleasure of being our ambassador to Azerbaijan between 2012 and 2014. And this is a, a, a very important uh, discussion uh, that we're uh, having today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the completion of the Southern Gas Corridor, uh, which is a major win for European energy security, a major win for the region and regional cooperation uh, in, the, uh, in the Caucasus. Uh, we have just a terrific group of speakers uh, and we'll, we'll get into what the lessons we've learned over the many years that the Southern Gas Corridor has moved towards completion, as well as what the opportunities and challenges are uh, for the future. So I think it'll be a, a terrific discussion. Uh, we're going to start off with, I think, one of the heroes of the Southern Gas Corridor, in fact, of, of all of Caspian Energy, uh, my good friend for over 20 years, uh, Elshad Nasirov, who is the uh, Vice President uh, of the State Oil Company of Azerbaijan for Investment uh, and Marketing. Uh, I've worked with him closely. I think everybody on our panel has worked with Elshad closely uh, and uh, really has had a steady hand throughout all of the years uh, to make completion of this project uh, as well as other projects uh, uh, possible. Uh, so Elshad will give opening remarks and speak for about uh, 10 minutes. Um, and then we have a just a terrific panel, all of whom are senior fellows now at the Atlantic Council, the Global Energy Center, and all of whom have had major involvement uh, in these projects and in the region. Uh, Neil Robert Brown, who is the managing director of the KKR Global Institute, uh, spent many years on Capitol Hill uh, with the Foreign Relations Committee and working with Senator Richard Lugar, the late Senator Lugar, who had just a major, major impact uh, on uh, the success of our Caspian, bipartisan Caspian policy. He'll talk about that and views uh, and any other views that he has. Uh, we have uh, Matt Breiser, who <laughs> I've worked with now for 25 years, uh, and who, uh, uh, former ambassador to Azerbaijan, uh, any number of U.S. government positions, uh, including working with me, uh, we have, we could probably spend the whole time telling war, telling war stories. Uh, he'll give his views, and particularly about about the future. Uh, we have Brenda Schaefer, uh, who's had tremendous teaching experience at Georgetown Haifa University, now at the Monterey Naval. Uh, Naval Institute, uh, an author. She's worked as a consultant with SOCAR, is a real expert uh, in, in the region. And, and Bob Scheer, our good friend uh, from BP, uh, who is now the head of uh, uh, international affairs for BP America. And he served as Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, during the Obama administration. Uh, for strategy, defense, and capabilities, uh, and uh, he can he can tell us about uh, the importance of uh, public-private uh, cooperation uh, with respect to this project. When we get to the, when we get to questions, uh, we'll have a Q and A period, and you can submit your questions through the Q and A function uh, on your uh, on your uh, your computers. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get to uh, uh, get to all of your questions. So really looking forward to this, and I'm going to turn it now. Turn it over to Elshad for his opening comments. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, you mentioned that I had something to do with the Southern Gas Corridor, and of course everybody knows in this auditorium that Richard Morningstar, Ambassador Morningstar, was not only the founding father but the grandfather of the Southern Gas Corridor and everything related to that. And I'm so happy and delighted to see you all in the morning of Washington across the ocean. And I'm really honored to be part of this panel, especially in such a short time after the integration of the Southern Gas Corridor. 
Good morning, Neil, Matt, Brenda, Bob, and all participants and attendees. Uh, I think that it's very important to have this celebration or analysis of the importance of the Southern Gas Corridor, especially now after several different achievements or events during the 2020 and the beginning of 2021, which brought us several big challenges. If I'm already mentioning history, to understand the significance of the opening of the Southern Gas Corridor, we need to go back to the beginning days of Azerbaijan restoration of independence, following the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know that Azerbaijan inherited a collapsed economy, and within months of our independence, 20% of our territory was occupied by the neighboring Armenia, and a million of our citizens turned into refugees and displaced persons. In this dire situation, a few people had an vision that Azerbaijan could resurrect its oil and gas industry. And with no money and landlocked geography, Azerbaijan could become a major oil and gas exporter. Let's also recall that the oil price was around $18 a barrel at the time, not exactly encouraging for major foreign investment in newly or in new oil production in newly independent country. But despite the difficult conditions with the visions of the president of Azerbaijan, together with the US President Bill Clinton, encouraged on by his advisor on Caspian Energy, Richard Morningstar, this vision overcame the obstacles and Azerbaijan has now become a major oil and gas exporter, as well as investor itself in pipelines and other major projects in Europe and elsewhere. As I mentioned, 2020 was a year of major challenges, namely the pandemic, of course. But at the same time, that year was a year of major achievements for Azerbaijan, for region and Europe. First, together, we have completed the 10-year journey of the Southern Gas Corridor. Despite the complexity and scope of the project, the Southern Gas Corridor was delivered on schedule and significantly below budget. Initial project costs were estimated at $45 billion, while in the end, the project was completed within 33 billion US dollars on investment. One of the first milestones was the historic joint declaration on the establishment of the Southern Gas Corridor signed on January 13, 2011, by the presidents of Azerbaijan and the European Commission. Many competing projects for transportation of gas were proposed and developed, such as Nabucco, ITGI, Whitestream, Agri. In mid-2013, the Chardonnay's consortium selected TAP as the transport route for the export of natural gas from the Caspian Sea to Europe. The volumes of TAP are quite modest relative to Europe's overall gas consumption. It's not a game changer from a volume point of view, but it's a game changer from a supplier and diversification perspective. This is its unique energy security and geopolitical contribution. If we go back to history again, we remember public demonstrations, protests, several law cases. In March 2011, a movimento notap made its first appearance in Milan Dunio, Italy. A year later, it became a well-known organization. They tagged the pipeline as not useful, given Europe's declining gas demand, dangerous for the environment and not safe. Opposition grew and led to a significant protest in September 2014. At that point, a clear line was set. Local municipalities and the Puglia region were against the project, while Italy's central government defended the strategic relevance of the pipeline. In 2015, Italy's SNAM purchased 20% stake in the project, changing its profile. When construction works began in Italy in May 2016, the protests on the ground turned violent. There were concerns about the fate of olive trees and tourism. But in the long run, citizens of Italy received a good New Year present in an extremely cold winter of 2021. The olive trees return to their soil. Tourism, tourism could not be harmed by a pipeline not visible in the beach. Still, it was ruined by the pandemic. At the same time, the Italian market had long been illiquid and prices at the PSV hub 
were higher than and at another continental other continental hubs in Europe. Now the spread between PSV and Northwestern European hubs has fallen by more than half. Also, liquidity is much improved, meaning that PSV assessments are now a more reliable guide to the Italian price. Second, this project has already changed the dynamics of the Turkish gas market, where Azerbaijan now is Turkey's number one supplier of gas. Third, and the most important achievement of 2020 for Azerbaijan, definitely the region and possibly the whole of Europe, has been the end of the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, with liberation of Azerbaijani territories, which were under occupation for more than 30 years. The unresolved conflict was always a threat to the supply routes from Azerbaijan to Turkey, Georgia, and Europe. Armenian representatives claimed that they proved they control the energy security of Europe. Now, not only the SGC has no sort of democracy hanging over it, but also as a result of the agreement signed after the war, all infrastructure, transportation and energy will be restored in the region from east to west and from north to south, enabling all countries of the Southern Caucasus and beyond to develop and prosper, including the Republic of Armenia, which for three decades had isolated itself from the regional cooperation and normal relationship with its neighbors. Of course, the best protection of SGC is peace. And the government of Azerbaijan plans that as part of SOCAR's next stage of project development, energy supplies will be renewed to Azerbaijan liberated territories. The supplies will be available to all population of the formerly occupied territories, irregardless of ethnicity, in the same way that energy supplies are available to all citizens of the country. Fourth, Another far-reaching achievement and an important milestone is our recently signed agreement with Turkmenistan for joint development of the Dostluk field in the middle of the Caspian Sea. Needless to say, this could not have been possible without the signing of the Convention on the Status of the Caspian Sea in August 2018, completion of SGC, and of course, an end to the Armenian-Azerbaijani war. It's an important precedent for our greater region from the Southern Caucasus and the Balkans to Central Asia and Kazakhstan. Instead of conflict over delimitation, simply to benefit together. This new cooperation with Turkmenistan will open up more opportunities for Central Asian gas to also join the Southern Gas Corridor. And I'm sure, Richard, you will see that, regardless of any doubts from your side. Now that the Southern Gas Corridor is up and running, SOCAR has turned its attention to development of Southern Gas Corridor Phase 2. In this phase, SOCAR aims to reach additional markets and transit natural gas from additional locations, as well as to develop Azerbaijan and tap gas resources. In the next phase, we hope to reach additional markets, such as in the Balkans, and to transit gas from additional sources. Among the promising options are gas from the Eastern Mediterranean, including that from Israel, Israeli gas to Turkey, and then entering Tanakh for a swap in the Turkish market is commercially the most viable option to export gas from the East Med into Europe. We support that option. And finally, on Azerbaijan gas export strategy. It reflects several principles. First, Azerbaijan works with all countries. Thus, Azerbaijan export gas in multiple directions and is prepared to transit it from multiple sources without discrimination. Second, the investing companies in the Southern Gas Corridor are from multiple countries and even different continents. A prevailing principle is that energy is never used as a coercive political tool. And third, Azerbaijan is not competing with any other supplier in the European market. It does not strive to supplant another supplier, rather to make more gas supplies available in Europe. Richard, I hope I squeezed myself into 10 minutes, so I'm ready to answer any questions from the audience. If any. That, that, that was uh, fantastic, Elshan, and I think you covered just about everything in 10 minutes. I just want to ask you a quick follow-up question. 
uh, before turning to the rest of the panel, because uh, I think it's really important. Uh, you did mention Armenia uh, and how isolated Armenia has been. And many have said that the really the only way to ultimately get a final settlement uh, with Armenia, even though the war is over at this point, um, is for there to be some real substantial regional economic cooperation uh, in which uh, Armenia and all countries benefit. Could you just be maybe a, a bit more specific in a couple of sentences as to what the energy benefits uh, will be to Armenia uh, by this regional cooperation? Thank you, Richard. That is a comprehensive and very interesting question. And of course, uh, we do agree that not only Armenia will benefit from the regional cooperation, but Azerbaijan as well, because right. Armenia is a market for our supplies. And if Armenia chooses to behave as a good neighbor, why don't we supply Armenia with our energy resources? And we can exchange electricity among between two or three countries. And of course, uh, for Armenia, uh, it will be not only the borders and market of Azerbaijan open for that country, but the enormous market of Turkey with their supplies, with their exports and imports. And definitely, it's up to the Armenian people to decide whether to live in peace with the neighbors or to keep isolation from its neighbors and keep trying to take some revanchist approach. But for many years, for three decades, we were uh, keeping saying to our Armenian neighbors that no one can live in a war forever with its neighbors. And despite the fact that Armenians, Armenians politicians kept saying that it's a frozen conflict, let's forget about the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, we were absolutely sure that one day this is going to explode. And that reminded me of a joke about a person who caught a golden fish and asked the fish to fulfill three of his wishes. One was to become a prince, the second was to live in a big palace, and the third was to be married to a beautiful young princess. So in the morning, the person woke up in his palace and he understood that from now on, he was a prince. After several minutes, a young, beautiful princess came in and told him, wake up, Prince Franz Ferdinand. It's high time we went to Sarajevo. So from this perspective, we understand that every conflict, whether frozen or not, it's not a solved conflict unless it's resolved completely. So we hope that we will be able together construct a region which will be exemplary for the outside world. And I hope that we will find understanding with our neighbors. Thank you, Alshad. Let's move to let's move now uh, uh, to the uh, to the panel. Um, and I'm going to start with Neil Brown and ask you to comment again on uh, the bipartisan uh, the bipartisan support there's been there has been for our Caspian policy really for the last 25 years, which I think has been you know hugely helpful. And one of the architects of that policy was your former boss, the late Senator Luger. Um, and if you could make if you could comment on the importance of that bipartisan cooperation, as well as talk about the relevance uh, of Caspian gas and its effects on. Uh, on uh, uh, European energy security. Sure. Thanks, Dick. Um, well, first, let me you know thank you for having me today, and and really pay tribute to you, uh, Ambassador Morningstar. Uh, everybody on the panel, but especially you for your leadership and and friendship over the years. Um, the <laughs> toiling between shuttling between capitals to make this project happen uh, was uh, many days not a fun task, and. Uh, and many days uh, was definitely thankless, uh, but but your perseverance paid you, you. off. Uh, you know, I, I I think that you know we all rightly uh, should celebrate completion of the Southern Gas Corridor. 
Um, although I think that there's a lot more to do. This is a backbone that's essential, uh, but I think that there's a lot more we can leverage off of it. Um, Elshad and uh, through his leadership um, has pointed out the possibilities on the front end with Turkmenistan, but there's a lot more we can do in the region as well. And um, and frankly, there's a this this project can pay can play an important role in in efforts to advance climate the climate agenda. So there's a lot more to do. You know, when when Senator Luger um, invited me to work on the Foreign Relations Committee back in 2005, that was the first time that there had been a dedicated staffer to energy um, in 30 years. And and you know what he had seen was that energy pervaded U.S. foreign policy, national security considerations. It took many different forms, but that it 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 was everywhere and it had insufficient attention. Uh, there were notable standouts like yourself and and uh, Matt Bryza who were working on it, uh, but it wasn't a, a top tier tissue, it, top tier issue, and he wanted it there. Um, and and as you say, that had bipartisan support. In this particular project, um, it, I guess maybe to give you a sense of the importance he put on it, um, he, my very first trip in 2005 with the Foreign Relations Committee, he dispatched me to Baku, Tbilisi, and Yerevan uh, to, to see what might be done. Um, and through the, the really the force of his, his position as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, his close partnership uh, with then ranking member Biden, um, uh, obviously now President Biden, um, and really his intellectual and moral leadership uh, plucked what was a project of great interest to a few people to really put it at the center of U.S. policy in the region. And in so doing, uh, to really make it uh, a, a core of the transatlantic partnership. Um, and, and I think that that was another big theme of the engagement. So it was bipartisanship, but it was also, it became a a point of cooperation in the transatlantic relationship in a very real way. Um, it, this, you know, in, in a world where, you know, everybody is, is much more interested in renewables and, and the like, I think that it does beg the question that, that you raised, you know, what is the relevance? And, and I think it is important just to, to take a step back. What is this really about? This project is fundamentally about the independence and sovereignty of Central Asia, of, of the Caucasus, and of Central and Eastern Europe. Control of gas flows is essential to Russian strategy of influence across all of those regions. It has been for a long time. And what this project seeks to do is to dilute the potency of gas for geopolitical ends by Russia. Um, we, we, had to, we had to put some, I think, softer language around that when we were in government, but now we're out of government. I think we can be a little bit more open about it. That's number one, and that, that uh, remains today. Second is to ensure and support continued solidarity of, of key transatlantic relationships. Um, that includes NATO and the European Union itself and the U.S. relationship with it. Russia seeks to use gas even today to divide both of those, both of those groupings, both of those alliances. And I, I remember back in 2005, you, would, we, you know, we would show up uh, at NATO headquarters, or we show up at European Commission, and they didn't really, they weren't really thinking about energy in these terms. They weren't thinking about it in a unified front. And oftentimes they were sort of, you know, sort of wondering why, why is this, uh, you know, American senator and his staff showing up to have these conversations. But you know, with perseverance and partnership with the State Department, we were able to, to make real progress. And then I think that the third big goal here is to anchor key US strategic relationships. Azerbaijan is, is one of those, right? There's a lot more to the US's area relationship than gas. Um, think about its strategic position between Russia and Iran. But gas is a big part of it. It's an anchor. It's an anchor with Georgia. It's an anchor with Turkey. It doesn't mean that there aren't problems in the relationship. Gas doesn't solve all of the region's issues, but it provides a piece of cooperation and economic alignment and geopolitical alignment that will transcend us. And, and that will, you know, final point on bipartisanship. These projects take a long time. And by the way, that's not just true of gas. That's true of any major infrastructure project. They have to outlive a current political cycle in the US or in Brussels or in any of the other capitals of the region. 
And so from the US perspective, having bipartisan support is absolutely essential to get continuity of policy. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Neil, very much uh, for all of those comments. And it, I, I think, you know, when you, it is really important to stress, given the political divides that we see in Washington, uh, God knows, given what we've gone through recently, uh, that it has been a strong bipartisan policy going back to 1995. Uh, and I think that's, that's why it's been uh, successful. And uh, uh, Senator Lugar, you and many others played an important, uh, an important role in that. Uh, let me let me turn to Brenda and uh, ask you uh, for your comments. Um, anything you might want to add to what you've heard? Uh, also, a question that some have asked: You know, with the with LNG playing such an important role uh, nowadays, uh, how much value is there uh, in and piped uh, and piped gas uh, going on into Europe. Okay. Uh, yeah. Th thank you uh, for, for this panel and uh, again for Ambassador Morningstar's leadership over really over three decades, not just for the Southern Gas Corridor, but all the Caspian pipelines uh, west westward. A real uh, visionary. So, I think the Southern the the inauguration of the Southern Gas Corridor should remind us that the geo of geopolitics is still really important. Because sometimes we live in this world where we think, oh, energy transition, uh, uh, regional cooperation, all these things to just, you know, kind of uh, trade, all these things that just happen. And we don't really need to worry about these like physical connections. And, and, and as, as Neil pointed out, that take, you know, really a, a decade, if not more, to, to make these things happen. And, and we have two incredible examples in, in recent weeks about the, the importance of actually, you know, building things, things that can change the geoeconomics and the geopolitics. So one on the issue of LNG, um, you know, we, we the, the joke is always that, uh, you know, when when the uh, when the U.S. catches a, a cold, the world sneezes. Well, you, you know, you have a cold spell in, in Asia um, and gas prices uh, LNG, uh, fly through the roof uh, in, in Europe and LNG cargoes are, aren't, aren't uh, available, right? But pipeline gas, including from the Southern Gas Corridor um, during this recent uh, uh, cold spike in Asia continued to flow, you know, was reliable, unlike the LNG and prices, they were higher, but they were certainly, not, you know, not in, in, in some sort of crisis mode. So, so meaning that the fact that you had these physical connections for pipeline gas into Europe uh, allowed not only security of supply, but security of price. And that's something when you're planning you know, energy uh, uh, infrastructure, you're planning uh, growth, you're, you, you need to know not only that the energy is going to arrive, but at, 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 at least at, at what, you know, what is the price band. Second, also, if we look what's happening right now in the United States as well, you know, really serious blackouts um, through, you know, millions of homes right, right now uh, in, in, in the United States, meaning that you just can't throw everything you want at a grid and somehow it's going to manage it. It's it's going to uh, do these do these wonders. You know, it's that sometimes we get so ahead of ourselves with having sort of uh, uh, goals about um, what our fuel mix should be. Um, you know, and 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 what what can what, that we forget that there's there are some physical you know limitations to to the grids to their capacities. Uh, we we don't you know we don't think about. Um, how much, like for instance, when we're trying to compute prices, you know, how much just keeping capacity in natural gas available, um, in, it, it enables renewables, right? We're, we're uh, uh, you know, with today's generation of renewables, you, ca you can't really run them, uh, efficient, you know, uh, in a reliable manner without having backup generation in, 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 in natural gas and then as a baseload fuel. So um, I think, again, yes, it's a reminder that um, we need the geo of geopolitics. And, Another reminder, for instance, you know, in the region, um, pipelines are still an object of military attack. You know, the real phase one of this war between Armenia and Azerbaijan was in July uh, 12th when the hills over the pipelines were, were, were attacked. So um, I'll pass it back to you, Richard. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks, uh, very, thanks very much, Brenda. And we have two more panelists to, uh, for me to ask questions to. I can also already see from the Q&A function there are huge numbers uh, of really important questions uh, that I hope we can <clears throat> that I hope we can get to. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to now ask Matt uh, Matt Bryza to make 
his comments. Uh, one point maybe, Matt, to emphasize is how important uh, regional cooperation has been. And when we, if we look back to when we were going to the Caspian region back in the 90s, uh, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline could not have been, could not have happened without the incredible leadership from Azerbaijan, President Aliyev, uh, President Shevardnadze in Georgia, and President Demirel in Turkey. Uh, there was incredible unity uh, with respect to that project. And I think that continued with respect to the Southern Gas Corridor uh, and with the leadership in uh, all three countries. How important, Matt, do you think that was? Any other comments you have on your long history uh, with the project and what you see for the future, either on the Trans-Caspian issues and the Dostuk project? And also, I think you have some ideas about more cooperation, where there can be more cooperation with Armenia. Ah, thanks, Dick. Thanks for, for that thoughtful question. And thanks for all the years of you leading me personally, us working together and you leading our efforts. Uh, you, you've had an enormous impact on my life, both professional and personal, as have, yeah, I mean, my friends on this panel. Um, yeah, it, th that regional cooperation was absolutely critical. Uh, it To me, um, the whole East-West Corridor, I mean, Baku Tbilisi Jehan, and well, basically all five pipelines that we actively supported, right, Dick? I mean, we supported, you know, not just BTC and not just the the South Caucasus uh, gas pipeline, but also uh, Baku Novorossiysk and Baku Supsa. Our goal was never to isolate Russia, not to isolate them, uh, but to, as Neil was suggesting, compel them or convince them uh, to behave more according to market-based principles than monopolistic ones. And that's something Elshad alluded to also in his remarks where he was saying, Sokar and Azerbaijan are not competing with any suppliers, but they wanna get as much gas to the European marketplace as possible so that market forces can ensue. So um, that vision of those three leaders that you mentioned, that was crucial to enabling President Clinton then and Leon Firth, <laughs> then Vice President Al Gore is a national security advisor fantastic man to say, hey, the U.S. does have a dog in this fight. It does matter to the United States that this largest discovery of hydrocarbons in the world since the north slope of Alaska makes its way to markets in a way that doesn't enhance monopolistic power, uh, that doesn't involve geographic choke points, be they the Strait of Hormuz or the Turkish Straits, uh, and then creates, as, as Alshad was talking about, greater liquidity in the market. Uh, and, and so the next point is that none of this could have ever happened if there wasn't also cooperation with the private sector, meaning the project had to make, or they had to make commercial sense. We all, I mean, Dick and Neil and Brenda, uh, uh, we, we all come, and Alshad, you came from the world of diplomacy too. We come from the world of where we want to think about these uh, infrastructure projects, energy infrastructure projects, having some sort of a dynamic impact on geopolitics. Uh, and then, you, of course, Elshad, then you became, you know, <laughs> the, the key guy at, 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 uh, in the business side at Sokar. But Bob lives in a different world, right? Even though Bob was formerly uh, one of us in the government. And, you know, if the projects don't make commercial sense, then they're not going to happen. And so, Dick, I, I, I pass the ball for a moment back to you to give you credit, because the, for me, the breakthrough moment was when we were having a meeting in the State Department in Steve Sostanovich's suite of offices. There were a couple of uh, BP uh, senior uh, reps from London, and they were worried. They said our main concern, and Lord Brown at the time, the, the CEO of BP at the time, was saying, <laughs> we're worried that Turkey isn't gonna be able to deliver its completion or, or it, on the project in, uh, on time and, at, but, and not on budget, as Elshad described has happened now with the Southern Quarter, this is for BTC. And Dick, your, your breakthrough idea sitting there at the table was, well, why don't we just convince Turkey to offer a completion guarantee? Turkey guarantees that the project will be completed on budget and on time and, and will pay penalties if that doesn't happen. Um, that ended up being enough to convince Lord Brown and BP to go ahead with, with the entire, not only BTC project, but it ended up being the Southern Corridor as well. Um, at the end of the day, there were some problems with Turkey delivering on the, uh, the, the payment of any such penalties, but the principle was clear. Everything's got to make sense, both for the companies and for the countries. So that gets to the Southern Corridor on gas. In the beginning, in the beginning, 
uh, there was huge resistance in Europe. And Dick, you, you, know, you were the ambassador to the EU, right? And you, you experienced that. And Neil, yeah, thank goodness you and Senator Luger were going to, to NATO and, and, and visiting with our, our other EU uh, friends and allies and explaining why this mattered for them. I had the same experience. I was virtually tossed out of the office of the Deputy Minister of Economy in Germany when he was saying, well, yeah, we really don't care what you Americans think about we should do with our energy supplies. This is this is our business. Um, and then I went back to Washington and explained this. And, and actually, President Bush said, yeah, they have a point. Why do we care so much if the Europeans don't care? But over time, they did. Our European allies did understand that they're way better off if they're helping us foster cooperation with with among Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, and then into the EU space on energy. And that's and that's what has happened. That's that's the whole point of this inauguration of, of the Southern Quarter. I'm I have to say I was I was a little disappointed. And Brenda, you you actually helped me, you brought this to my attention that there wasn't a statement by the European Union when the Southern Gas Corridor began operating, when TAP began delivering gas <laughs> under the Adriatic to Italy. Uh, wow, why? This was a really big deal. And I don't know the answer. So let's fast forward then to now. Um, and Dick, your, your comments about things that can be done, can take advantage of the Southern Corridor in a positive way uh, to, to make it even more politically relevant now that it makes commercial sense. Um, Elshad, you and Neil, you, th th there are many things you put on the table that are of real great interest right now geopolitically. I mean, to bring Israeli gas to the to the most logical market, the biggest, the fastest growing market in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is Turkey, that makes commercial sense. And maybe that can make even more geopolitical sense. How? That gas, or with the Dostluk agreement, that field in, in the middle of the Caspian Sea that formed a blockage between Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan for decades. It prevented a, a Trans-Caspian pipeline from being any sort of a reality. That's now resolved. And so that could be a supply of natural gas, right? Uh, that could come westward. I hope it will maybe help Azerbaijan develop its petrochemical sector even faster. Azerbaijan could use a bit more gas, uh, but maybe it possibly combined with natural gas from, from Israel delivered uh, to Turkey. Maybe that could, and I'm gonna have a to issue a dis disclaimer here in a second or, or <laughs> full disclosure. Maybe that could allow for a creative investment that could help heal these wounds of the second Nagorno-Karabakh war, which could be maybe, maybe a petrochemicals complex in an organized industrial zone uh, in this magical <laughs> geographic spot where the territories of Azerbaijan in Nakhchivan, Armenia and Turkey all converge. Maybe there could be an industrial zone there to manufacture something like petrochemicals, uh, which require or, or can use natural gas as, as a feedstock uh, and in a way that will generate economic growth and jobs and healing and integrate reintegration of Armenia into the regional and indeed the, the you know, the, the South Caucasus European economies uh, through a joint project. Um, if, if I'm an Armenian right now, I would be saying, oh God, what are you talking about? You know, we, we, we're still trying to digest this war. Uh, we think the conflict isn't settled uh, because we still wanna talk about the political status and legal status of Nagorno-Karabakh. I'm speaking now as a former Minsk Group co-chair. But for Azerbaijan and Russia, the conflict is over. The, the November 9th and 10th agreement settled it and there's no discussion in that agreement signed by the prime minister of Armenia about any change in legal status of Azerbaijan. So I think that reality still needs to be digested in Armenia and in its diasporas, but hopefully there will be a point soon, who knows when, months, years, when that sort of a collaborative approach to use natural gas coming from the east or southeast, whether it's Israel, Turkmenistan, or Azerbaijan, can help heal these wounds of war. I think that really merits attention. And I hope that the US government and the Biden administration will think again in the strategic way all of us on this panel did 20 plus years ago and step up and try to bring all the parties together to bring these supplies of natural gas into this strategically relevant region where Azerbaijan, Turkey, and Armenia converge uh, and, and, and allow this 
public-private partnership, the cooperation of all the states in the region and of companies succeed uh, in a commercially attractive way uh, that heals the wounds of war. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much, uh, Matt, uh, and for your comments. And, and, and I think it's opportune now to go to Bob Scheer from BP. Uh, you mentioned the role that BP has played. I think BP has played an incredible role uh, in this region, going back to the deal of the century uh, in, uh, 19, in 1995. Uh, if BP had not recognized that the only way to get oil out of the Caspian uh, in the 1990s, or a lot of oil, was through Jehan and not other alternatives, uh, Baku Tbilisi Jehan may not have happened. BP was also incredibly cooperative and working through working through with us, uh, getting support for what ended up being TANAP and the TAP pipeline when it was recognized that Nabucco just was not going to work commercially. Uh, and BP agreed that that gas would have to go to the Balkans uh, through uh, through Bulgaria ultimately as well, and that the pipeline needed to be expandable and made it possible for there to be continued support both in the US and in the EU. I might add that the EU also has played a tremendous role and I regret we don't have anybody from the EU on the, on the panel, but they are, have obviously stated how important the completion of the Southern Gas Corridor is. So, so Bob, I would ask you to comment also on public private sector uh, cooperation and also uh, where you see gas fitting uh, in, you know, in the future and how to deal with what's happening, for example, with the energy transition, what's happening in Europe, uh, what concerns would you have, and maybe Elshad can respond to this as well, about uh, carbon border adjustment mechanisms, uh, how to work together on the European Green Deal. Uh, is it possible for BP and SOCAR to work together on BPs, and also not just BPs, but all of our decarbonization goals with respect to gas? Uh, and uh, making gas more, even more environmentally compatible. Um, so maybe if you could give us a few comments in those areas. Sure, sure. Recognizing that I'm the only thing standing between uh, um, questions uh, as well. So I'll try to be brief. Uh, look, I think the, the other panel has covered a lot of this. Uh, you know, I mean, one of the things that we look at is uh, you know, we all know the incredible accomplishment of the Southern Gas Corridor across a range of actors, public, private, et cetera. It couldn't have happened without all of that. From the BP perspective, of course, this is a technical problem. This is a clear technical issue and a, and a, a huge engineering marvel, frankly. Um, one of the largest infrastructure projects attempted uh, in the past decades. and. It's, you know, it only works if in fact you know that you are have a commercially viable piece and you have a politically viable piece. Um, we can only in BP control the technical piece along with our partners, but we also know that um, we have to have all the other pieces aligned. And I think, um, you know, if you look at what made this successful, I think that's what you also want to take a look at for what any future projects of this scale and scope would need to have as, as a backdrop for them in order for them to be successful. And again, very quickly, I'd say it's the business case foremost. There has to be has to be side on each of it. There's a lot of money up front and uh, a lot of capital investment and incredibly difficult to justify sometimes if you and always difficult to justify if you don't have the business case. There's no political piece that will make this work if there's not a business case behind it. Um, the technical expertise is obviously going to be a, a key piece, clear goals and mission of what you're trying to accomplish. And then I think the things that we've really focused on, but appropriately, the private public cooperation, making sure that there is an understanding that there are both technical and political pieces to this. And then I, I have to end with a partnership, and that's both a partnership within the consortium. BP did not do this alone. We have always had tremendous partners from the very beginning in Azerbaijan, and SOCAR is first among equals in that. 
and then also with other pieces around as you go through and follow the track of the Southern Gas Corridor. I think other people have talked a lot about the role of gas, um, and I'm happy to talk more in question and answer, going to it in, in greater depth about the role of gas in uh, transition to a cleaner economy and a cleaner, you know, greener approach. We and BP are committed to being a net zero company in 2050, if not sooner, and also to helping the world get there. But we also see that natural gas has a role to play in that, um, especially when you look at globally how many other fuels are being used that are not nearly as clean as natural gas, assuming that we can appropriately address methane issues that emerge from production of natural gas. So I think that is one piece that you want to see natural gas as part of the solution and that we believe we can see it as part of the solution and a bridge, but not forever and not across all elements. You also have the issue of the market for natural gas, which I think the Southern Gas Corridor is a big piece of and people have talked about. But it is, you know, it, there's always the attempt, gas and, and oil get lumped together, but in terms of market mechanisms, they're very different. And looking at both dependencies are different and the, the liquidity of the market. So the Southern Gas Corridor and LNG and other sources of supply is a really key to trying to get the market to behave more like a broader, dare I say, liquid market that we have for oil, for example, in the energy sector. I think a lot of people neglect to remember or, or don't know in the first place that in fact Europe gets far more, a, a higher percentage of its oil from Russia than it gets its natural gas from Russia. And yet people tend not to be concerned about that. Well, there's a reason for that. And that's because of the dynamics of the market. What the Southern Gas Corridor, what LNG, what other modes of supply allow is for that greater diversification, which we all benefit from as long as there's a business case to support a really big infrastructure piece. And I think that's how we'll have to look to all of the future. Um, I, I am wary of the time. I have lots of other things I'm happy to talk about, but there were some really great questions. So Dick, I'm, I'm happy to hold off or answer any questions that you think I may have missed in that. But let's be clear that it's this broad effort of private public partnership, recognizing the benefits both to industry and to the governments and to the peoples and the market that really made for that bringing together what was an incredibly successful partnership and sets of coalition that I think if all in our hearts and hearts, hearts and minds asked us a couple of years ago, would this actually have come off on time and under budget? I think uh, while I never would have said it as part of BP, I think many people might have uh, whispered, well, maybe not quite. And frankly, now that it's done, no one should forget how monumental a task this was and how many different elements and players it required to get this successfully through and couldn't have done it without our partners everywhere. Hey, thanks very much, Bob. I mean, we have a ton of questions uh, and I'm basically have in effect asked some of those questions to the panelists and my comments already. Uh, but let me just ask you maybe to elaborate a little bit, and some of the others may want to expand on it. Do you have concerns about gas demand in Europe? Uh, is this gas going to continue to be important? Uh, how much concern do you have over things like carbon border adjustments, uh, general negativity? It seems like negativity in Europe towards gas. Uh, uh, there was also a question, for example, whether uh, Turkstream uh, could have an effect on Caspian gas. Uh, do you have any comments on that? And maybe some of the other panelists might also uh, uh, jump in if they would like to. Yeah. So I think, look, if you look around at um, the production of energy in Europe I, I, and the growth, I think you still see a viable path for the use of natural gas into the future. Um, how long into the future is a, is, is a question I think none of us can particularly answer, but it is, it is a combination looking across all of this. And we do think uh, in BP, not just because we want to think that, but our, our economists tell us this, that there is a role for natural gas uh, in Europe as we look to the future. 
Now there's a role for a lot of other pieces too. And, and again, we are the carbon border tax adjustment, the green new deal in Europe. We think this is something that we can and should be a part of. And I think you're, you're starting to see a lot of this. Um, our CEO has penned a, uh, an op-ed with some of the leading and talks with some of the leading environmental actors that you can't just count out companies that are willing to be greening, if you will, and that the solution is not just with new green technology, but it is how do you move from brown companies, if you will, to greening. And again, FT had a headline about olive companies, um, somewhere in between green and brown. Um, we, I believe we're going to be part of the solution and want to be part of the solution. Um, some people think that's just, uh, uh, again, to use these terms, greenwashing. Um, but I can tell you that from BP's perspective, that's not true and that we are committed to working and helping. But we also know that people need power and need, we need to figure out a way to work through lowering carbon into the atmosphere, given the limited carbon budget the world has, but doing that as fast as possible. And the answer to that is not only going to be pursuing renewables as quickly as possible. It's got to be a combination of other things if you want to be successful, if you just want to do renewables, we simply don't have the capability to scale. No one has the capability to scale that quickly. So you've got to do things in combination. So we think there is still a role for natural gas for the foreseeable future in getting to that lower carbon world. And we support any activity that countries or entities go forward with that look to figure out how we can get more carbon, put less carbon into the atmosphere and take some carbon away. And we're going to spread the net wide and not really care how it is done because we understand the world needs that. And we think natural gas absolutely is a part of that. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Bob. Let me uh, turn to Elshad. Uh, uh, what comments you may have uh, on what Bob has been talking about and how SOCAR might work with BP and others and just within your own company um, on the green transition in decarbonizing gas and uh, and other work that you're doing very briefly maybe you could add some a few comments on that thank you richard first of all it's our honor and pleasure to work with bp and any project that bp is doing we're gladly participating in in those uh our logo is not as green as bp but we also have a flare of green color in our logo at the same time, I think that we have to remember that uh, the carbon related environment was absolutely different in 2013 when FID was taken about Chardonnay's and SGC construction from Azerbaijan to Europe. Now it's absolutely different and the European institutions are no longer willing to pay or finance the hydrocarbon projects, including gas pipelines construction. But at the same time, we don't have to forget that uh, gas is the cleanest of all fossil fuels and gas is uh, enhancing the Europe's uh, ecological clean production and ecological uh, clear situation. Uh, at the same time, we have to think very fast with the changing environment. And I remember the words of the Saudi Minister of Oil who said somewhere in 1960s that uh, the Stone Age ended not because they didn't have any stones left. So we have plenty of oil, plenty of gas, but still we're thinking already, also together with BP, Japanese companies, German companies, about the hydro, hydrogen technologies and we have already completed the research and analysis about the uh, capacity of TANAP pipeline, for instance, to carry hydrogen to the European Union. And it seems that up to 20% of the capacity of the pipeline can be, can be used for the transportation of hydrogen without any technical solutions or additional uh, vast uh, financial investments. So, I think that every company that used to be an oil and gas company has to think in a new way. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alshad. All of that is, 
is really important, including your comments and work you're doing on hydrogen. I think, you know, the Caspian has already been cleaned up considerably. I mean, I can remember when I first started coming to Baku, which was in 1994, uh, and flying into Baku at night with all the flaring uh, in the Caspian, the sky was orange. I, you would think you were flying into Dante's Inferno or something. <laughs> it, uh, it was, the, the flaring was so great. You don't see any of that anymore uh, when flying in, or, and, and also for some years. So there is progress being made, and uh, I think what, you're, what you've offered is, uh, is very constructive. Well, let me get into another topic, subject of some, of some, uh, of some questions. Uh, uh, Transcaspian, uh, a Transcaspian pipeline. Uh, the the Dostuk agreement, which basically al will allow Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan to cooperate on a project in the middle of the Caspian, which was an area of a border border dispute, going back now from when I started coming to uh, Baku in the middle to late 90s. Matt. I were trying to mediate that at, uh, uh, at one point. Finally, finally, an agreement between Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan that may allow product to flow uh, uh, towards Azerbaijan uh, when when that's completed. Uh, what? How much interference do you think there might be from Russia, who's always been against anything going from the Caspian East? Uh, also, what about Iran? Our friend Dan Stein has asked the question that uh, Iran hasn't signed the border agreements that uh, the other uh, littoral countries to the Caspian, countries bordering the Caspian signed, you know, a few years ago. Do you, ex do you expect any interference from Iran or Russia? Uh, do you think this project can be completed? And ultimately, can there be a Trans-Caspian pipeline? One other thing I need to mention, because Matt asked me to, because he forgot to disclose and he said he was going to make a disclosure that he's on the board of what is it, Turkas, comp Turkas company, uh, in in Turkey, and working on some of these issues, particularly gas coming from Israel and so forth. But no conflict, he said, with what's going on. But he wanted to at least disclose that. Uh, any any event, uh, Elsha, do you want to start with that, and then Matt maybe, and anybody else who wants to jump in? Oh yes, okay, Richard, thank you. Uh, I think that uh, in the uh, question of uh, the opposition of Russian Federation or Iran towards the construction of any pipeline from Turkmenistan uh, to Azerbaijan, uh, the situation is no longer that uh, tense. First of all, because the transportation of Turkmenistani gas uh, through Azerbaijan to Europe already happened. Uh, before the American sanctions and the uh, European sanctions against Iran were imposed uh, on the 1st of October 2016, we started transportation of Turkmenistan and gas through Iran to Azerbaijan and Georgia. And of course, the molecular Turkmenistan and gas reached Turkey at that time. So there is no phenomenon or precedent of, uh, there is already precedent of transportation of gas from Turkmenistan to Turkey and uh, possibly next to Europe across Iran. And the pipeline is no longer a condition to that. Second, in 2018, the convention was signed. And it's not the intention of Russia or Iran, but the intention of Turkmenistan to construct or not to construct a pipeline is the biggest issue. So now when the Southern Gas Corridor is ready, when Azerbaijan is no longer a risky country, which has the border with its uh, neighbor in 15 kilometers from the gas transportation route and the conflict is still going on. So the situation is absolutely different. And definitely Turkmenistan needs a westward transportation. So I think that Everything depends on the country which hosts hydrocarbons. I mean, Turkmenistan. Thank you. Uh, any concerns about Iran? I don't think that is an issue. Okay. And, and what environmental about... Environmental issues are not 
uh, not an obstacle at all. Because in, a con in the Convention on the Status of the Caspian Sea, only a pipeline from shore to shore is subject to an independent environmental analysis. An interconnector between two gas fields, one in Azerbaijan, one is in Turkmenistan, is not a subject for any approval. Right. And I, I, I suppose also, Elshad, that there's there are a lot of resources within Azerbaijan's territory that also can be used to expand the southern corridor. Yes, definitely. Every uh, project was waiting for the SGC to be uh, to be a reality. Frankly speaking, it was there were thousands of people who didn't believe that a pipeline of that extent can be constructed for 3,400 kilometers. But now it's a reality. We are, you know, we're at our 11.30 time, 12.30 time in the U.S., but uh, we also have permission to go another 15 minutes. I hope most of you or all of you can, can stay on because there are, uh, there are many, more, uh, many more questions out there. Um, our, friend, our friend John Roberts, uh, also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, noted journalist, asked, I think, a very interesting question. It's directed to Matt and to Elshad but anybody else who wants to jump in, saying that, you know, it really makes the most sense on Eastern Mediterranean gas, he feels, is gas going from Israel, uh, uh, projects that Israel's involved with, to Turkey and on into the, uh, and on into the Southern Gas Corridor. Uh, and he asks the question, if there are any lessons from the resolution between Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan uh, with respect to the Dostuk project uh, uh, that might be helpful in ultimately getting uh, some cooperation uh, in the Eastern Med uh, that might allow this to happen. I know Brenda might have some views on this as well. And, um, and whoever else, Matt or Bob. Uh, yeah. Why don't we, why, uh, Neil or Bob. Why don't, why don't we uh, start with you, Matt, on this one, since you are in Istanbul, even as we speak. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. And, and thanks for, uh, you know, reminding everybody that I did send around a note to everybody. I just, I cut off my, my, my intervention too quickly, but uh, my dis disclaimer, yeah, with Turkas, uh, I did uh, work very hard to try to get Leviathan gas to Turkey, because that is the most logical market for that gas. And I, I, there's, there's a point in the note I sent around, for some reason, somebody, some sneaky person, put on my Wikipedia bio that Turkas is a subsidiary of Sokar. I, I'm not astute enough on webinology to figure out how to get that off there, but it's not. Sokar is a publicly traded company. It's on the Istanbul stock market. So enough of that. Um, so yeah, I think, um, I, I think there is a lesson. And at the risk of repeating some of the spirit of my initial intervention, I'll say that what has to happen is that the politics and the commerciality need to get lined up. Commercially, there is no doubt that the most logical destination for that Israeli gas is Turkey. As Neil and I discussed several years ago, even if that is the, the paying market, it's still not clear that that makes commercial sense because it's a challenging field and an expensive pipeline. And who knows what the natural gas prices are going to be in Turkey and you know in Europe, throughout Europe. If we include Turkey in Europe, it's a buyer's market as far as we can see into the future. So the economics may never work out, but if they don't work out for Turkey, they're not going to work out for anywhere else except small volumes, maybe you know into Israel and the West Bank and Jordan. Uh, so um, that's a possibility. But the lesson would be, so number one, the economics have to line up with the politics. What happened with Dostluk was that, yeah, the, 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 finally the economics and politics lined up. First, the economics came in, 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 in play, as, as Elshad was saying, because the Southern Gas Corridor became a reality. And so there was no longer a disincentive for the developers of Azerbaijan Shah Deniz field to resist more gas coming across the Caspian, right? I mean, BP brilliantly led the whole establishment of the Southern Corridor as a dual oil and gas corridor, looking way into the future and, you know, following then CEO Lord Brown's vision that BP should stand for beyond petroleum <laughs> and not just British petroleum. Uh, and so the economics had worked out. Uh, and then, as Elshad said in his uh, opening, the politics then finally worked out. Uh, and and the, the, the end of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is a big part of that. 
I think that Azerbaijan finally felt secure enough and comfortable enough uh, to then reach back to Turkmenistan and say, okay, let's try to build a, a bigger corridor. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm in touch with some of the people <laughs> involved in the negotiations on a gas sales and purchase agreement between Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan, and it's, it's difficult. The Turkmenistanis are, you know, they, they, they are not going to, I think, negotiate from, uh, want to negotiate from a position of weakness. They're, they're going to drive a hard bargain, but it's doable. Um, and so finally, the question is on Russia, as was asked to Elsha just now, I, I do believe that Russia is going to oppose uh, Turkmenistani gas. Uh, westward. It always has, as has Iran. Even after August 2018, Russian and Turkmenistani officials have publicly said uh, the environmental concerns are too significant, the poor Caspian seal, and what if there's a gas leak and some methane bubbles to the surface and dissipates? Ooh, what, what a disaster. Um, but I, th I think they're going to continue to oppose it. And if you look at, finally, the, what was it, the January 11th agreement or statement among Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Russia about infrastructure projects, transportation projects being the focus, aimed again at bringing the countries together. Inserted in there is a veto right for any of those three countries on any project. So I would guess Russia will resist and try to block a new natural gas pipeline that brings Turkmenistani gas through that new corridor linking Nakhchivan in Azerbaijan to the rest of Azerbaijan via Armenia. But if, if that happens, there is that Iran route that Alshad talked about. I don't know how the Biden administration is going to react to that. We know how the Trump administration did. Um, or last point, there is a project now uh, announced to deliver gas that would come from Azerbaijan and maybe Turkmenistan through the Southern corridor via Tanap and a spur from, from Turkey into Nakhchivan. So it can still happen, even if Russia, Russia opposes it, but from Azerbaijan's perspective, probably Armenia's perspective too, it's much better to do all this uh, if there can be some buy-in from Moscow. Well, thanks, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, there are two, uh, two, maybe to close out, there are two more questions, and I, I apologize, maybe not getting to every single question, but I think we've covered one way or another most most of them. Uh, Rich Kozlerich, former ambassador, uh, U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan, asks a very practical question that relates to what we've been talking about. Uh, Who's going to fund these projects? Uh, given the pandemic, given the uncertainty perhaps on gas demand, even though prices are very high right now because of a very cold winter, uh, do you envision that some of the projects that we've been talking about uh, are actually going to be fundable? Uh, and, uh, uh, and who would fund it? And, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, Brenda, you haven't said much. Maybe you and Bob or Neil might comment on that. And then I have another question that I'll ask Neil afterwards. Um, I'd like to actually go back to the Turkey Turkey Israel issue. So I think that uh, um, I, I think I think that uh, rewarming of relations between Turkey and Israel, something that would also be a precondition to any you know a gas trade, um, is much more doable uh, than it than it seems. I mean, first thing, these countries have diplomatic relations. As much as I'm I'm very enthusiastic about the Abraham Accords, but let's recall for years, decades. Turkey, Turkey and Israel, Turkey, uh, Israel and Azerbaijan, and all the Muslim majority countries of Central Asia have always had excellent, uh, you know, relations. So the Abraham Accords widens the circle with the Muslim world. It doesn't, it doesn't start the circle. Uh, between Turkey and Israel, there's zero issues of, of conflict. You can't talk about a border issue, a delimitation issue, a refugee issue, holy sites. There's nothing on the bilateral agenda between. Israel and Turkey that's that you know it, it, it's that's in conflict they do have different views on Palestinian related issues on the Hamas for instance um, but they but on their direct you know national interest there is there is nothing in dispute so I think I think that those relations um, can um, uh, rewarm up quite quickly 
um, and uh, um, that could facilitate uh, gas trade, which is probably the most logical, uh, commercially the most logical export uh, option uh, for, for Israel. Um, uh, that being said, and this is interrelated to maybe the question about um, you know other cooperation projects. Let's not dream too much of peace pipeline. Um, you know, if you remember all the debates when when Israel's discovery started in Cyprus. Oh, this is going to change the Middle East. It's going to change Cyprus. And we see the exact opposite: that the, when there's oil and gas resources, that actually increases the propensity to conflict, not the opposite. So, so good relations, uh, you know, peace can produce economic cooperation, but oil and gas trade can't produce peace. So, so yes, post-war, um, you know, reinforcing uh, cooperation in the region, you know, can bring benefits. Hopefully show the population of Armenia, for instance, that peace, you know, brings concrete benefits to, to its people. Um, you know, good relations between Turkey and Israel can facilitate gas trade. But, not, but let's stay away from these peace pipeline hopes that, that somehow if we, you know, trade in oil products, somehow it's going to remove and give the real, you know, the real issues of, of contention between countries. Okay, let me go ahead and turn that then to either Neil or, uh, or Bob. And on the funding question, uh, you know, Neil, you work for a major private, huge private equity firm, uh, Bob, obviously, at BP. Uh, are these new projects fundable in this day and age? Uh, or is it pipe dreaming to talk about uh, new projects? Or maybe we have a hiatus period that we could resolve obstacles, for example, like in the Eastern Med and make the politics ready for projects two or three or four years down the road. Yeah, Neil, yeah, no, I, sure. Uh, I, I think that the one of the big takeaways from the Southern Corridor is, of course, the public private partnership to actually fund the project, to make the commercial case, to make it viable. That is something that is a, a bit of an exception rather than the rule in energy diplomacy thus far. But it's going to have a much bigger role when you think about it, the energy diplomacy in the future, not just in this region, but around the world. You think about you know, energy diplomacy today is living in the the reality of oil and gas geopolitics and the change that in that that's coming in the transition, but also in new energy geopolitics, whether that's supply chains or cybersecurity or critical minerals. And as you think about ex the U.S. expanding its energy diplomacy around the world, you're going to have to have a bigger role for the private sector. There'll be some projects that are commercial just on their own, on their merits. But absent that, you know, the US taxpayer isn't and shouldn't be writing a check, a blank check on these projects. What you can do is deploy a number of financing instruments to encourage more private investment. So it could be first loss guarantees, it could be credit guarantees, it could be uh, credit guarantees to long-term contracts. There are many tools out there that can make projects bankable if there's enough political will. And that, that gets me to the diplomatic point is, as we talk about Turkmenistan, we talk about Eastern Med, we talk about growth of the Southern Corridor and Southeastern uh, Europe, there has to be sufficient political will. And there's a, an irreplaceable role for the United States in this. The US can't solve all the problems, but when you think about, just think about Turkmenistan, what, what fundamentally is holding them back? It's fear of Russia. They need confidence that the US will be there with them, that it will not allow a, uh, a, a very harsh uh, intervention uh, in the leadership or in other ways in Turkmenistan. That plays out in different ways around, around the region. You know, Bulgaria is a country that needs much more US attention right now as just an example. I think last point, I, I wanna go back to this climate point because I think it actually is the crux of political will when you think about energy diplomacy going ahead, both in the EU and the US. And you know, just some perspective here. We I personally, you know, we're, you know, want to see irrelevance of some of these projects in the future with the transition. But think about that, you know, the EU's energy neutrality target is 2050, more or less, 30 years from now. Think about where we were 30 years ago. Azerbaijan wasn't even independent yet. Geopolitics still matters. A lot can change. And so, and I guarantee you that energy markets dominated by Russian gas are going to be much more resistant to the energy transition, to greening up than energy markets that are aligned with the United States or with Europe. Because we know it's not just about the gas, it's the corruption, it's the lack of transparency, it's the broken markets. 
And so you, you have to make these two realities, this reality of geopolitics of oil and gas and the re reality of new energy meet together to be complementary in our energy diplomacy. I think that's entirely possible, uh, but it does take new thinking for all of us that have been working on this for years and, and who, whoever comes next. Uh, thanks, Neil. Uh, Bob, I don't know if you want to add something at this point on the funding point. Uh, the okay. one thing I guess I'd add really quickly, Dick, is that not all of those things that, that were mentioned, absolutely right. And also, what is the market? You know, what is the, the what are the aspects of the natural gas market itself? And are those the same? And, and any of those, all of those things have to get rolled in before you can make any any final investment decision. And I think that the dynamics of the market have changed, of the natural gas market have changed, and uh, also the dynamics of the capital expenditure of major oil and gas companies has changed. It would all have to be factored in. Thanks. Okay, well, I'm going to ask the last question. We're really getting, uh, uh, we're, we're, we may, I may, I, we might get shut off. I don't know. But uh, the last question, and then I would ask you all to make any kind of closing comment that you'd like to make, and then I'll thank everybody. Uh, th this question was asked by, from the audience, saying that, you know, in the Obama and Trump administrations, we really didn't pay much, U.S. really didn't pay much attention to the region. How can we get the Biden administration to pay more attention? I, I disagree a little bit on the premise. I mean, I was there during the Obama administration. I think a lot of attention was paid, particularly in the energy area, because I was doing it. Uh, but uh, aside from that, uh, but what 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 can and maybe Neil, I, I'll again start with you. What can be done to encourage this new administration to take a greater interest in the region. And then I'll ask each of the uh, other panelists to make any final comments and then we'll call it a day. We could go for another three hours if we had the time. Yeah, I, I think just just three, three quick things. The, the first is to recognize that President Biden has been a supporter and understander of these issues for a very long time. Um, he was our close ally um, and working on these projects in the Senate, and he continued to advocate uh, w when he was uh, vice president. So there's a good base. Uh, two, there's also a good bipartisan base in Congress still. You know, you know, whatever your view on the specific issues around uh, sanctions on Nord Stream 2, et cetera, what you have there is a core, um, and also thinking about the, uh, the uh, three C's funding initiative, et cetera, there, is, there has continued to be bipartisan support for activity that should be built upon, expanded. And then third, I think is to set out a vision, you know, set out a vision of where we would like to see these energy geopolitics in a traditional sense and energy geopolitics of the transition, where are they to go for the entire region? And we do have to think, you know, we have to think about the caucuses, but we have to think more broadly. We have to include Central Asia. We have to include Central and Eastern Europe into that vision. Thanks very much. Okay, we're just going to go around to the others for any further, any final comments. Uh, so, Elshad, uh, do you have anything final you'd like to say? Oh, yes, Richard, thank you. Uh, I wouldn't agree that the Trump administration didn't pay enough attention to the energy issues. If you remember the conversation in front of the White House with the Prime Minister Conte of Italy when President Trump frankly speaking, demanded that the Italian government fulfills its obligation in the construction of the Southern Gas Corridor. And that helped a lot. Uh, the second issue is the Azerbaijan-Turkmenistan deal. I don't think this is something new uh, because we have very good examples of the joint development of uh, disputed uh, oil and gas fields between Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, and Vietnam. And both delegations from Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan visited Kuala Lumpur to find out what was the heritage and experience of those countries. So I hope that in one year's time, in February 2022, we discuss the conclusion of something practical between Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan, and we'll sort of write it together. And as we promised Richard, We'll go together to Ashgabat to celebrate. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Brenda, any a final, com a final comment? Um, 
Well, in order to uh, raise importance of the region with uh, the current administration, you know, f first I, I completely concur with uh, Neil Brown that um, Biden, as senator and vice president, was was extremely active on the region. So I think it's it, it's quite it would be quite natural. But I would just plaster a map of the South Caucasus and the greater region, the meeting ground of Russia, Iran, and Turkey. If that isn't enough to convince U.S. policymakers that it's an extremely important region, I mean, anything you want to do, whether it's Middle East, Russia, Southern Europe, um, this this epicenter touches on all uh, those issues. And in the same in the same accord, also to think about U.S. and Turkey really have to get back to you know a normal uh, relations of of, uh, of of allies too, because Turkey is also crucial to again Middle East, Russia. Southern Europe and you know any of these issues, um, it, it, it's um, if the U.S. is serious about any of them, um, Iran, Russia, Turkey um, needs to be needs to bring in the South Caucasus to its strategic thinking. Thank, thank you, Brenda. That, the, the geography is a hugely important point, and you know I, I never stop thinking about when in Baku drive two and a half hours to the north and you're in Russia, Dagestan, two hours to the south you're in Iran. I mean it's uh, I think sometimes people don't realize that. Uh, Matt, fi a brief final comment. Sure, yeah, 11, I think 11 climatic zones, also in Azerbaijan on that driving trip, yeah. Um, what matters is getting as much natural gas into the marketplace as possible. It, it's it's the, the idea, we all like to think geopolitically, but really it, as long as the market is liquid and is working, nobody can use natural gas supplies as a political weapon. Two. Um, natural gas is going to be in demand for a long time, even though demand is relatively low now compared with the past, it's going to be needed because uh, in the transition to renewables, well, there's always going to be need for baseload. If baseload for electricity is generated by natural gas that's half as dirty or twice as clean as coal, that's good. <laughs> and then natural gas is going to be needed for petrochemicals for a long time. Third and final comment. There are amazing little tidbits of uh, prag pragmatism in what Elshad has said. I won't go into them all. <laughs> Obviously, we're out of time. But A, the fact that uh, Malaysia and Petronas are involved in those discussions, uh, Elshad, that you mentioned. That's important because it was Petronas that was the operator of Block 1 in the far western uh, portion of Turkmenistan's piece of the Caspian Sea. That gas most naturally has a market not going north to Russia or east to China, but westward to Azerbaijan and beyond. And you also said, as, as an aside, very gently, Asha, you said that um, if a pipeline is built from one field in the Caspian to another one, then nobody else's permission among the littoral states of the Caspian is required to allow that, that project to go ahead. So from block one, to Azari Shirag Yuneshli or wherever else in Azerbaijan, what, you're, what I'm interpreting you as saying is that, that such a, not a totally Trans-Caspian pipeline, but field to field, would in effect de facto be a Trans-Caspian pipeline uh, that would circumvent uh, any sort of legal objections that might be uh, lodged against it. That's an important statement. Thank you. Okay, Laura Macedo from our events task might kill me. And if she does, that will pave the way for the Trans-Caspian pipeline, since I always said it wouldn't happen during my lifetime. Uh, two, two final, very brief final comments. Bob, a final comment. And then if, Neil, you have anything further to add, or maybe you made your final comment. Just a, a thanks for bringing everybody together, Dick, and also a recognition that there's a reason there's so many people that have to be, that have to talk about this issue because of all the cooperation that has to go on both between companies like BP and SOCAR or companies and governments as we've discussed. But thank you all. Thank you, Neil. I mean, Bob. Neil. <laughs> no, well said. Thank, thanks, you know, recognizing really the, the your own leadership, Dick, um, Elshad, Brenda, Matt, Bob, and, and many people who aren't on this group. Uh, really tremendous work. Okay, thank you, uh, Neil. This has been a tremendous panel. Uh, uh, we covered so much ground. Uh, it was it was great, Elshad, to have you. I mean, you're always terrific. We had a terrific panel with, you know, Matt, Bob, Brenda, and Neil. Uh, and you know, we're looking forward to uh, future uh, Atlantic Council events. I think I just got a chat message from Laura saying she would never kill me. Uh, but uh, anyway, 
Uh, but I also hope that you'll join us uh, for our, uh, we have a, a really interesting upcoming event uh, tomorrow at four o'clock, the road ahead, Pennsylvania's energy future, a long way, uh, a long way from the Caspian. Leaders of Pennsylvania's energy industry are gonna speak. You can go to the Atlantic Council website to register. I wanna thank uh, everybody who's helped to put this together. Um, our wonderful intern, Maria Castillo, Laura Macedo, who I just mentioned from our event staff, Peter Gonzalez, Kelsey Foran, uh, Zach Strauss, and of course, uh, um, Olga Kakova, who works with me on so many things. Uh, and this discussion is available on the Atlantic Council website, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, please share it with your colleagues. Thanks again. I think it was a fantastic discussion. So let's sign off. Thanks, Dick. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Bye.